very good singing. Why don't you grab your Bible and we're going to turn to 1 Peter chapter number 4 and pick up where we left off the last time we were in 1 Peter. We're almost done with 1 Peter. Probably be one or two more Sundays and we will be done. But 1 Peter chapter number 4 and I'd actually like to uh, start by reading the last verse. And then I would like to start back in chapter 1 and kind of pick out a few verses in each chapter uh, that we want to review because it basically has everything to, to do with our message tonight. <clears throat> and I think I'm, there you go, live. All right. First Peter chapter number 4, I'm going to read verse number 19. And it says this, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Let's read it one more time. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Over and over throughout 1 Peter, we're talking about a group of people, a group of Christians who are suffering. They're suffering as new Christians, and it's addressed from the very first chapter in 1 Peter, chapter number 1. It says, starting in verse number uh, 6, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season... If need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Chapter number 2 and verse number 18 says, Servants, be subjects to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Look at uh, chapter number 3. and verse 13, it says, And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Look at chapter number 4 and in verse number 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin." that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, 
revelings, banquetings, abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory, of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. In 1 Peter, we see a book that is written to Christians who had been suffering for the name of Christ. We see new Christians, newborn babes in Christ, who were being physically persecuted. They were being uh, sawn asunder. They were being burnt at the stake. They were being torn apart by lions. They were being separated from families. They were losing their jobs. They were being persecuted just uh, by conversation. They had people that were just talking bad about them. Oh, they don't. They don't come hang out with us anymore. They don't, they don't do that anymore. They don't go there anymore. And they were being spoken evil of. And here throughout the, first, uh, the book of 1 Peter, uh, Peter is encouraging these Christians and he's saying, Hey, I want you to rejoice when you're suffering wrongfully. Number one, don't be shocked when the Christian life has some potholes, speed bumps, breakdowns, letdowns, disappointments, persecutions, death, and or disease. Now in the context, we're talking about persecution, but look, we know that trials come into the Christian's life and God uh, lets them come into our life according to his will. And so in verse number uh, 12 of chapter number four, it says, beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Now, Peter once rebuked Christ for saying that he would suffer. If we go back in our Bibles um, to the book of Mark, if you want to turn to the book of Mark and chapter number 8, um, and I'm going to start reading verse number 27. Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So there was a time in Peter's life where he himself was rebuking Jesus, the Messiah, for saying that he would suffer to pay for our sins. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 8 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience 
by the things which he suffered. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 13, you can write it down. Paul talks about the fact that uh, they know how his life has been and that he suffered persecution. And he says, uh, Yea, all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We shouldn't be shocked when Christ allows suffering to come into our life. Verse number 13 says this, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Um, I think it's crazy that a lot of times the world is searching for happiness and we don't think even as Christians that happiness comes as a result of suffering or going through a trial. In fact, I know in my case, I would try to push suffering away. I like comfort. I like the windows down. I like the wind blowing through my hair. I like the temperature to be right. I like to be comfortable in my clothes. I like to be comfortable when I'm sleeping. Um, my wife can tell you the t-shirts, they can't be too tight on my neck. She gets mad. I stretch all that stuff out when it's brand new. I like to be comfortable. And when trials come into our life, when suffering comes through our life, when persecution might come into our life, God has a purpose for it. And as we begin to uh, enjoy the presence of Christ in this trial, then all of a sudden we become happy by practicing his very presence in that trial and we can rejoice. It's funny that it doesn't say be happy. It doesn't say I'm commanding you to be happy in this suffering, but it points out the fact that if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. It's simply a result of being purified with Christ. The Bible says in uh, Proverbs 25 and verse 4, Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. You guys realize that Jesus, in his love for us, in his example that he has set for us, he allows us to go through persecution. He allows us to go through the fire and he's there with us and he's there strengthening us. And as we come through that trial, then we, we have a, a greater understanding of the rejection that Christ faced as he became a human for us. And it increases our faith. It increases our love and it gives us a, a desire to to know him even more and to make him known even more. The Bible says in verse number, uh, verse number 15, it says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. So it's funny that Peter is talking to these Christians, people who are obviously... Uh, in chapter number one, they're rejoicing and they have an exceeding abundant joy in their life. And uh, they're walking with Christ and they're growing in Christ. And yet he points out, hey, let none of you suffer as a murderer, as an evildoer. Let none of you suffer as a thief. And so to me, it's like he's kind of pointing out to them that, hey, as a Christian, when Christ is in you, uh, it doesn't look like this. There shouldn't, you shouldn't be suffering. See, all suffering isn't in God's will. Some suffering is brought, in, brought on by ourselves, by our own actions. There's consequences for our actions. Um, a lot of times we would think that, huh, like if I were to address this group right here and say, you guys don't, suffer as a murderer you shouldn't murder you shouldn't kill and everybody would think like well you don't need to tell us that you know i remember growing up as a kid we would always go into my dad's office who pastored in southern california and we would go through his stuff and look for the candy and we would find the treats and everything well one time i pulled a drawer out and there was a huge knife in his drawer that i'd never seen before 
I didn't find out till many, many years later as that knife stayed with us. I don't know if you still have it, but as that knife stayed with us, I found out the story behind that knife. Now, I don't know who the lady was. My dad never told me. But this lady who sat faithfully in church brought the knife to church. And she said, Pastor, I need to give this to you so that I do not kill my husband. That's a legit story. I found out years later that that knife was in there because that lady didn't want to be tempted to off her husband. Now, no one in the church would have thought that this sweet lady was going to go home while her husband was sleeping and fasten uh, this knife through his skull to the pillow. But yet, here's a, a time where Peter is calling out to the church and he's saying, hey, if you're going to suffer, suffer for well-doing. If you're going to go through persecution and trials, don't let it be because of your sin. Because sin has a price that must be paid. And yes, while Christ paid the ultimate price of our sin on the cross and took away the guilt from us, there's still consequences on this earth that we would have to face because of our sin. He goes from the ultimate murdering to also saying, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer. But then he says, last of all, or as a busybody in other men's matters. In other words, mind your own business. Don't stick your neck out where it doesn't belong. Because suffering can come to you when you get nosy and you begin gossiping and you begin sticking your nose where it doesn't belong. And he's saying, hey, Christians, not only don't murder, don't steal, don't be an evildoer, don't let suffering come on you because you're just... Uh, you're not minding your own business. He's like, hey, if you're going to suffer, verse number 17, for the time has come that judgment, or sorry, 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. Listen, there is certain things as a Christian that when it comes to other people's business, I just need, if I hear something that's kind of like, well, I'm going to pray for him. You know, but not all the time do I have to go and get into their business. You know what? Sometimes it's better if I just pray for them. I don't have to spread anything. I don't have to. And, and you know what? A lot can be said for a church, the body of Christ, who learns how to just mind their own business all while being part of the body of God. Man, love covers a multitude of sins. Uh, uh, love worketh no ill. The Bible we already covered in 1 Peter that says, don't let us speak deceit with our mouth. Man, there is something about the body of Christ that can come here from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different cultures, different financial statuses, and we can all come, rub shoulders, work together, go forward, pointing our community to the Lord Jesus Christ, all while we're growing together. And, it, and man, there's so much suffering that we bring into our life because it's like, oh, hey, did you hear about? And it just, it doesn't have to be like that. The Bible says, um, oh, I didn't realize I brought the whole notebook. Um, the Bible says in, in uh, Proverbs 26 and verse 20, 17, 17, he that passeth by and meddleth with strife, belonging not to him, is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. Now, I just think that that's a good picture of being a busybody in other men's matters. You know, if you were smart, you wouldn't walk through this property. You guys heard my brother's dog is going nuts a little, a little while ago. If you were smart, you wouldn't, as those dogs are running up to you barking, you wouldn't grab Brutus's ear and just twist that thing. I think if you were here last Sunday or the Sunday before, whenever that was, uh, we had someone walking through the property who got a little taste of, um, I wonder if they've walked through since, I don't know, but they got a little taste of what it would be like if you took a dog by the ear. It's just, 
It's just unnecessary. So I think what Peter is pointing out, the person that one time told Jesus Christ, he started rebuking him because Jesus says, hey, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be killed. And three days later, I'm going to rise again. And Peter began to rebuke him. No, you're not going to suffer. You're, you're our Messiah. You're not going to go through that. You're, and now Peter has done a 180. Christ did suffer. Uh, Christ did raise from the dead. Uh, Christ was real to Peter. In fact, Peter on the shores after the resurrection of Christ, uh, Jesus said to him, uh, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. And he got a commission from Jesus Christ. And now he's writing to people who are suffering for their love and their, uh, their being a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ. And he's saying to them, hey, If it's the will of God that you're suffering, man, commit yourself to a faithful creator. Understand that he's going to use this trial to strengthen you, that God would be glorified. It's, it's not the end, right? This is as bad as it gets. The suffering on this earth is as bad as it gets. Look what it says in verse uh, number 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Um, God said that suffering will come. You could write Matthew 24 and verse 18 down. Uh, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel. Peter makes the application of suffering very clear. He's saying to us, you guys, judgment has to begin at us. The suffering, the persecution has to come to, to us first. And he says, through that suffering, God is going to be glorified. And he says, look, if the righteous scarcely be saved from this persecution and this suffering, what is the end of them going to be that are the enemies of Jesus Christ? What is the end of them going to be the ones who have rejected Christ? Um, let's see. If God's own children can go through suffering on this earth, what is to become of his enemies? Verse number 19, and we'll be done. It says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. Um, the Bible says uh, in Luke 23 and verse number 46, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Do you guys realize that as a Christian, As someone who has placed my trust in Jesus Christ, God is going to allow persecution to come into my life. He's going to allow suffering to come into my life because he's a good God and he's going to have good things come from it. He says uh, in verse number 19, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. I wrote this down. Christians, in all of our distresses, look to the keeping of our soul rather than the preserving of our body. See, God has a, a greater plan than just right here, right now. God has a, an eternal plan for you and for me. So it's like the suffering, in fact, there's a verse, uh, That talks about the suffering of this world. It can't even be compared to what is waiting for us. Amen. God has something so awesome prepared that he says, Hey, I want you that are suffering according to the will of God. Hey, if it's not a sin, if, if it's not because you murdered someone, you stole something, you're a busybody in other men's matters. If you're suffering because of something that is completely out of your control and not a consequence of your sin, then you can commit your soul to Christ, to God, as a faithful creator. Why? Man, I love that verse because it's like, man, God is faithful. 
He's faithful and he's going to be with me to the end. That verse that I read in Luke 23, when Jesus was hanging on the cross and said, Father, into my hands, I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. When he says, I commend my spirit, it is the same exact word that we find in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 19, when it says uh, to commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. You see, Christ did the same exact thing when he was going through his suffering. He commended his spirit to the Lord. He said, Lord, uh, we know that Jesus said, uh, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. We know that there's going to be times that we go through and that others go through things that we love that are hard. But when we understand that we have a faithful creator who has our best interest in mind, and we understand that this is as bad as it's going to get. This is as bad as it's going to get. And that when Christ returns or, or we pass away and we go to be with him before Christ returns, uh, like the testimonies tonight, um, we can have hope. You know, uh, I believe it's even in even in First Peter. I'm going to flip back there and we'll close with this verse. It says in First Peter 3 and verse number um, 14 and 15. But if ye but and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye and be not afraid of their terror. Neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You see, there's a reason that God allows us to go through a trial. There's a reason he lets us be persecuted. There's a reason he lets us suffer. It's because somebody is going to turn around and see that you're happy in the middle of a trial because of who you've committed your soul to and they're going to ask what is the reason why you're so happy Rhonda your testimony tonight right you have a peace you you you've been in the word more you don't know what the outcome of this is going to be you don't know what the results are going to be but there's a peace in your heart that someone could say man how are you so calm going through this Go ahead. Yeah. So, so God allows us to go through these things for a reason. Uh, when you know that uh, Christ will allow this suffering to come into your life or this persecution to come into your life, and in the context, um, really, by and large, it's more persecution. It's more persecution as you... Take a stand for Christ. Um, this morning in, uh, in uh, the teen class, we talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going into the fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow, facing persecution uh, simply because they were taking a stand. Right? They didn't have, I don't think they made poster boards. I don't think that they were, um, you know, picketing and chanting and rioting and because and protesting i think they just they just took a stand and they suffered because of it and i think christ asked us to do the same thing hey i'm gonna i want you to just take a stand when everybody else is bowing i want you to take a stand when the old crowd is going this direction i want you to take a stand and just say yeah you know i don't i don't do that anymore and they're going to speak evil of you and god says hey that's, that's a little bit of suffering. It's a small price to pay, but I'm going to do something awesome with it. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, I love you. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the example that you left us um, when you suffered and then just said, uh, Father, I commend my hands or my life into you, into you. And I pray that you would help us, God, to commit our soul to your keeping as well, because you are a faithful creator. We can trust you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Um, I guess heads bowed, eyes closed. Grandma, you could play.